The story of Jonah is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's a, it's a, a treasure in literature of, of uh, the form of the short story. And most of you probably remember, but I'll give you the quick recap of the story of Jonah. It's not a particularly long story. So Jonah was a prophet in Israel, and he gets a message from the Lord telling him to go to Nineveh and to preach repentance. And, and you got to understand that like Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, and that is Israel's biggest enemy in sort of the kingdom period. In fact, it's Assyria that's going to come and eventually wipe out the northern kingdom. But, but in the context of our story, we have to keep in mind that Nineveh is a place where all the evil in the world resides in the eyes of Jonah and probably most of Israel. And so God has called him to go to where all those terrible people are who want to come and kill Jonah and all of his uh, family and friends and the people he knows and cares about and to tell them about God's good news. And Jonah, you might recall from the story, is not interested in doing that particular little task on God's behalf. And so if Nineveh is over that way, Jonah tries to go that way as far as he can go. It says he's on his way to Tarshish, which is basically just the ancient Hebrew version of Timbuktu. He's on his way to somewhere as far away and isolated as you can imagine. And he's on a boat, and while he's on the boat, there's a big storm, and Jonah believes that the storm has been sent by God to punish Jonah because he's supposed to be going that way, and he's actually going that way. And so Jonah, really, in a, in a really remarkable act, he tells his fellow travelers on the boat that, look, this is all because of me, this storm. If you just throw me overboard, everything will be fine. And you know what? They do it. They actually just throw them overboard. I mean, it's not like a lot of debate or anything. Uh, they just like, okay, here you go. Foosh. So Jonah sinks down into the sea. And this is the part that probably everybody remembers. This is where Jonah gets swallowed by a big fish. Now, you may have learned it was Jonah in the whale, but the Hebrew actually says big fish. And if you look that up online, there's a lot of debate over what kind of fish it was, but that's really not important because it's a short story. At any rate, the big fish swallows Jonah for three days. That's a big important number in sort of Hebrew ideas. And after three days, Jonah prays to the Lord and basically says, all right, I'll go to Nineveh. And so the big fish spits Jonah out. That's what it says. It spits him out onto the beach. And so Jonah's been inside a fish for three days. So that's probably not a really pleasant sight. But anyway, it doesn't say anything about him taking a bath or anything, but he heads off straight to Nineveh. And so Jonah is a prophet. And if you look at all of the prophets in Israel, if you look at Jonah, Jonah is undoubtedly the worst prophet ever. He's incredibly indifferent to this task with which God has given him. Lots of people in the Bible go, oh God, I'm unworthy for this task, but they do their best. No, not Jonah. Jonah thinks he's pretty okay, but like his heart is not in it. And so instead of going around and telling people about the good news, he basically just walks through the city going like, you guys are going to burn. 40 days more, all done. And so Jonah, the worst prophet ever, puts in zero effort right he's basically you know the cartoon with the guy and the sign that says the end is near that's Jonah he's just walking around with a sign that says the end is near but despite the fact that Jonah is the laziest and the most worthless prophet he is also the most amazingly successful prophet ever in fact the story tells us that despite Jonah's indifference despite his kind of not wanting to do this, despite him like phoning it in basically on his prophet job, everyone in the city repents. I mean, the story tells us not, not only did the people repent, the livestock repented. You'll notice that they left out a few verses in this morning's reading. The middle part is about the livestock 
who are repenting. The cows and the donkeys and the, and the pet dogs and cats, they all put on sackcloth and sit in ashes and repent of their sins and evil. I mean, really? The livestock are repenting. This Jonah guy is amazingly successful despite his indifference. And then, of course, it tells us that God changes his mind. He decides he's not really going to kill the Ninevites after all. And do you think Jonah would be happy about this? No. Jonah is not happy about this. In fact, he's really, he's PO'd, right? He's really angry that God has decided to forgive these horrible, evil people who want to kill him. God has decided to relent. And and so Jonah goes up onto a mountain around the city hoping that God actually will destroy them after all. And there's a whole other bit of the story. But but for for what we need to talk about today, what really matters for us is I think there's some really good news in this story for us as Christians today. And the first is that even if the evil Ninevites wanted to destroy Israel, and actually eventually do, that even they are not outside of the boundaries of God's love. That God cares for them as much as he does his chosen people. That the Ninevites are worthy of God's care and attention. And if the Ninevites are worthy, then there is no one in the world who is unworthy. If the implacable enemies of the people of God are worthy of God's care and love and forgiveness, then so is everybody we know. So are we. The other good news, I think, is that Jonah didn't really do a very good job of evangelizing. And yet, through the power of God, even his meager effort paid off huge dividends. And I think this is important for us to consider because we live in a cultural context today where there's, there's a lot of negativity directed at the church. A, a lot of it earned and deserved, not necessarily by like us here in this good place, but you know, the church writ large is in a, in a, a considered by many people to be... Um, an organization, an institution unworthy of its founder. Because as much as people really don't like church in the world today, it seems to me, people still seem to really like Jesus. In fact, the biggest complaint I hear about people, about church, is that we don't live up to the teachings and example of our founder. It isn't that they don't like Jesus, it's like they don't like Jesus' friends. And the, so while there's, there's, Jesus is still a compelling figure. And what Jesus represents, I think, is something that people hunger for. People need and want love. People need and want forgiveness. People need and want reconciliation. People need and want to find a new and better, different way of life. And it's not a life that is like all happiness and joy, faith. But faith does provide us sort of a, something deeper, something more meaningful, a sort of a contentment, a satisfaction with life that, that in my experience was not accessible in, in any other way. Now, part of what we're being called to is this idea that to share the good news, right? And we share the good news in lots of ways. We share the good news by, by helping our neighbors, by, by being there to assist people and lift them up. We, we, we do it by giving generously of our time and our talent and our treasure. But, you know, St. Francis said, maybe, he's, he's attributed as saying, um, you know, in everything you do, spread the gospel. If necessary, use words. But I say, use words. 
right? And evangelism is tough for us, this idea of sharing our faith. I don't know what it is. There's something about Episcopalians, and I'm sure actually most mainline churches, but, but Episcopalians are the people I know, and I know for many of us it's really difficult to share our faith, and, and partly because we, we recognize that not everybody wants to hear it, and, and none of us wants to, like, turn people away or make people think poorly of us, right? To, also, faith for many of us is something very deep and very private, and it's not the kind of thing we, we share readily, right? It's something that we keep kind of deep in ourselves. I, I, I think I've shared this before, but I read somewhere, and, and this may or may not be true, but the average Episcopalian invites someone to church once every 27 years. And I think we can shorten that like a little bit. You know, like, like nine at least, right? So it's important for us to find ways to share our faith, right? Because, because the love of God has the power to transform our lives, to, to alter them, to take the things that, that are hurting us, the things that we are afraid of, and to, and to turn them into something else to take away their power over us so that we can live lives where we are truly free to be the people God created us to be, to be people who are unafraid and bold in our loving actions in the world. Right? And it's important for us because Christianity isn't something that we can do all by ourselves. It requires others to do that we can't really be the people of God unless there are people, right? Jesus didn't call us to be the persons of God, each individually finding their own way. And in fact, when Jesus ascended to be in heaven, he didn't leave behind a big book or instructions or, or anything like that. He left behind a small group of friends, and he invited them to share what they had seen and what they had heard and what they had learned with the people that they encountered in the world. And that's what they did. They went out across the four corners of the globe and, and shared what they had seen and, and what they had heard and what they had learned. And the people that they shared with shared with more people who shared with more people who shared with more people down across the generations until someone shared with you what they had seen and what they had heard and what they had learned about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so this is an important part of our calling as God's people to, to share who we are by sharing who we follow. And that if, if we can't do that, then we are not living into our baptisms fully. We are not doing what God created us to do. Because God's desire is that everyone you know, everyone you've ever met, everyone you've ever encountered, that they, like you, should know the power of God's love. And that they should know that they never have to walk alone, that they need not be afraid or anxious. For God has them has you in God's loving embrace forever. Amen.